The views and opinions expressed within the video content found on the Indie Comics Network are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of the Indie Comics Network or its sponsors. Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, I'm going to be working a bit on my book today. My original plan was to do Roni Kenshin, but I had some MS issues and fell behind on work I needed to get done, so I'm doing it here. Uh, I promise I will do Kenshin at some point in the new year. Call it my New Year's resolution to draw Roni Kenshin. But other than that. <clears throat> hey friend, how you doing? Hope you're doing well. Oh, let me give people a, a brief look at what the comic is. I'm um, doing a couple of boring things, and then I'm going to be doing some coloring. So it should be kind of interesting. I might do some inking, depending on how I get things going. But this is the book. Um, the title of the screen was A Girl in Her Shadow. That was the original title of this book. Uh, I changed it because I'm focusing it more on my character, Danny, who is this character here, and she is the last sentinel. Um, more on that as things go. Is it? Uh, actually. Got a cat behind me doing things. Uh, also want to grab something. Mm. So, there we go. Hey, John. How's it going? Hope you're doing well. It's the afternoon, but as good as it could be right now. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, my water more where I can see it. Oh. But okay, so what is The Last Sentinel? The Last Sentinel is effectively... Uh, continuation of my comic, The Manifested, um, which was a comic I did back in 2020. It's a black and white book. <clears throat> that basically was my first foray into really putting out my own comic. Um, I've been drawing pretty much all my life, but some of the stuff in it. <clears throat> and some other pieces in it. But yeah, so I do have copies of this if anyone would be interested, and I have um, digital copies available on my Gumroad. It's like five bucks, I think. Um, I'll dig up the link if anyone's interested. Hmm. So yeah, it's fun stuff, and a lot of it was me getting my feet under me and really kind of developing what I wanted to do. Now, this book ended on a cliffhanger sequence um, that I had numerous false starts on trying to do issue two, but it focused heavily on three characters. This character, Kare. Hmm. Another character named Peter, and this is basically the ending of it. But effectively focused on these three characters, where we have Kari, and then we have Peter, and this is Danny, original version of her. How many pages does it? How many pages does it have? Uh, it's twenty-four pages. I think it's 20 story, and then I included a bunch of my concept art. Uh, let's go back to there. So effectively what I did is after doing a bunch of false starts and trying to figure out how I wanted to do it, I figured I would tone it down to two characters, and that eventually went down to mainly one character, which I'm just focusing it on Danny. Um, 
with the inside of it. I actually discuss it here in this part here that will be there. Uh, this is the picking up basically right where the other one left off, and I kind of explain what's going on. I have a cat up to something. Hang on one second. I'm going to yell at him. Be right back. I want to make sure he doesn't eat something he shouldn't because cats are stupid. Sorry about that. Cats are dumb and do stupid things. Uh, but I love them. But anyway, so this is basically where the book picks up, which is I'm starting at the end, and I basically kind of explain what's going on so a new reader could just pick it up and go. And I do talk about it early on. Kitten is untouchable, just I can touch her a little, she bites and scratches. Yeah, that's true with a lot of kittens, they they do that. You gotta, gotta handle them a lot to kind of get them to break that, along with um, just kind of showing them good life. <clears throat> but yeah, so I set this up as kind of a background thing of what's going on. And then I do what I was intending on doing, which was separating the story off, where they separate. And this is where I am focusing on um, Danny. Now, I have a narrator character um, who is just Aaron Wolfram. As I say here, he's a bard in training and a wanderer by inclination. Um, and he basically tells the story of um, all my characters and things. And that brings me to the page I'm actively working on. I have a few others done. Uh, this is scanned in. I have to ink it in along with those pages. I actually have a bit more done, but I only want to show so much. Hmm. But yeah. So that's basically what we're doing. And I'm going to be doing a little bit of lettering, which will kind of lead in, like I have currently this section right here lettered, and it's going to be a bit more up on the top. I just kind of set things in as I want it. Um, as was stated by some of my colleagues lately, when people were talking about their influences, I definitely have some uh, comic influences and I have a lot of literary influences. And this is heavily influenced by um, Musha movies, and um, one of the other big things would be, uh, what would be it, um, what's the word for it? Uh, i trying to think of the books that are specifically influenced by. Uh, like the Mistborn series by Brandon Sanderson, The Nevernight Chronicles by Trey Kristoff. Um, there's a book called Graceling, which I was very influenced by. Uh, and a few other places. Okay, let me get that up real quick. And I just want to check out my color scheme, which I have in a different window. He's eating something. He should be eating his cat food and not plastic. 
Because cats. C3, M4, and Y4. Okay. It's doing an ongoing story. I found it's best to recap the previous issue, Cliffhanger, to bring the readers up to speed as to what I'm about to jump into. Yeah, no, there's a lot of books that do that. Um, I agree. Uh, the point, well, basically, what I'm going to be hoping to do with this stuff is. Um, I'm going to tell the entire story that I want to tell with this story that will focus just on uh, Danny. Um, and the next book is actually going to be A Girl in Her Shadow. Let's watch this up. C3. Uh, and I'll probably do a recap in that, just kind of do things. Uh, the sword and sorcery genre has always been an interest to me, and I definitely intend to kind of move in that direction with it. C3M4Y4. It's part of the fun that I can do now. I can just pull things in. If anybody's wondering, I'm using the craft tone brushes, which basically let me create this old style of a comic book feel. I love the old Marvel comics from like the 1970s and early 80s. Um, they just call to me in a lot of ways. I like the design aesthetics of them. I like the color palette choices. Um, the uh, just oh, most of everything that you can find in them. And when I found these interesting um, tones for it to basically create things the old-fashioned way in some ways it's harder but uh to do because there's a lot more work that has to be done on them but that's fine by me i don't mind doing it because again i do a lot of this stuff because it's fun um i'll have to touch this up a little bit but you know oops that was a screw up. I'm supposed to do it on different layers. It starts to blend and make a new color. That would have been smart. But as you can see, it's now making this purplish color just by blending two things in. And yes, I would agree with your frame. The old ones are great. And this will turn it brown. looks kind of brown. Okay. Thank you. 
jump up to here and now I don't need the coloring to be perfect. I need it to basically look decent. Um, let's go move some ink dark like that. A cat coughing. This might be a heavy make sure the cats are okay stream. Okay, it's not perfect. He's just got hacking a bit. Yeah, he's just hacking. Alright, he's got a hairball. Hopefully, he won't launch everything all over the place. lost my wood texture though. This is basically the paper texture right here, or if I turn that off, everything turns kind of yellowish, but I have everything to be kind of this neutral gray, but it's still textured. Um, since when you like comics and manga, I've always liked comics and manga. I've been reading manga since the late 80s. I actually started reading after I saw the movie Akira. I went back and I found the, um, the manga for it. Um, I read a lot of manga. I actually read a bit more manga than I do comics. a little bit. And what I'll probably do is add in a um gradient to use as a skyline. So that's basically what I did on this page here. Well, actually, I just used a, um, a brush that I separated the background from, and I just brushed in a color uh, to give that kind of misty effect. Yeah. 
And next week, we're going to have Chris on again. And I'll be doing a kind of an interview the way I did with Dave Finch with her. Um, I think it should be fun. I also hope to have, at some point in the future, uh, Ian Nichols on. Talk about his time working on The Tick. And maybe we were supposed to, I was supposed to be actually on Ian's channel on Wednesday. But due to an unforeseen circumstance in travel problems, he wasn't home in time. So maybe I'll try to do our Bernie Wrightson stream that we were going to do, or reach draw something Bernie Wrightson inspired uh, on here. Be it Swamp Thing, The Ghoul, Frankenstein. Um, Hell, we could do stuff from like Dead She Said, um, Creepy and Eerie. Um, I believe he did. Um, yeah, he worked on House of Secrets and House of um, Mystery, so we could get Cain and Abel. So, yeah, we have definitely lots of stuff that we could do. I will be having Dave Finch on again in the future um, uh, to both promote um, his season two of his Kickstarter that he's doing for his uh, draw stream, and also to uh, we're going to be talking D and D. My brother will be on to actually talk about his D and D world, which his D and D world and my fantasy world are well, they're the same world. So, if you're interested in things that go on in them, or if you're into D&D and stuff like that, you will, you could see basically that in this comic. Uh, that being said, uh, the comic version is different from the D&D the version. It's kind of like his literary version of it is different from... Um, the D and D games we don't really have in our in the comic version and the, the the literary version there aren't a lot of other races aside from human. Um, there are a few, but not they're not like D and D. They're not like a plethora of weird things. Like we don't have elves and dwarves really, but the D and D version does. I do have what effectively is the tiefling, but they're. They're a bit different. We do have monsters and things. Um, the orc, for instance, is very different in my um, in my setting than it is in D and D. Oh, actually, my D and D version of the orc is fairly similar. They're not really a they're not a friendly race. They're more like, well, they're heavily inspired by Tolkien, where they're kind of like a, it's like a plant. And they're literally known as the Scourge. So they're seen as a scourge on the land. They go into an area and they corrupt it. They don't really have society or anything of that nature. They're just kind of a menace. Which isn't very D and D these days. They generally they've been trying to back off on orcs just being an evil race in D and D. Which is fine you're interested if that's how you want to play the game and all that you know i'm not here to tell people how to have fun hmm. that was a motorcycle kind of cold uh. okay 
It seems Germany, that place. Do you mean the setting that I'm working on right now? The inspiration, the base of the fantasy look here? Uh, I could kind of see Ger a Germanic kind of look to it. I mean, I basically drew what I thought was generic fantasy buildings. Uh, I heavily referenced... Um, uh, what was it? What was the country that I did my initial stuff in? Uh, it's where they filmed the Underworld movies. Um, it's like on the tip of my tongue. That was the initial place that I used for a lot of reference. Um, the setting in the fantasy world is... Um, it's on the Lake Ozen, uh, the Ozen Lake, and it is, I I show it on here, yeah, this is the Ozen Lake, uh, this is Raven's Edge, and, um, effectively it is a spot that's off of the the Silken Way, which is our variation of the Silk Road. Um, and one of the chief differences with our area, uh, Danny is an Asian character. She is uh, a Sunset Kingdomer, since our Asian kingdoms are in the West. Uh, she is effectively Tibetan. Check the, the hill. Hold on, something's up the clip studio. Which is never something I wanna I wanna say. something real quick. Okay, it's my pen. Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Fraser Co? Fraser Co? Fraser Co? Fraser Co? I'm not really sure. I'm just going to go with it. Okay, bear with me here, my tablet's acting weird.
All good. All right. Yeah, it's definitely there. It's just not registering the click. Interesting. Building it real quick. Bear with me here. Yep, it's definitely something with the way my Mac is not responding to the clicks in the slightest. not about to draw with my mouse. Let's see. Let's try restarting the tablet. I'm still recognizing it. It's weird. It it recognizes the motion and everything of the mouse, but it's not recognizing the click. That worked. Even opened it when I did that. Something with the way it's seen the pen.
I admit, I've done some weird shit, but... I swear this isn't anything dirty. For some reason, Wacom puts their pens in something that just looks very dirty. Yep, so it's not the pen. This is a completely separate one that's doing the same thing. Okay. This is telling me just work on traditional art in your streams. Hmm. Well, that's annoying. think of something. I kind of want to see what would happen if I reboot, but I don't want to lose the stream. don't think it would end, but I don't just want to leave it blank. The way I'm proud. Uh, yep, I restarted the Wacom processes, so, uh, to try to get around that, um, but yeah, that is something I tried to do. <clears throat> I actually went through and rebooted a bunch of things. But yeah, the... Just check anything else, see if I missed anything. No, it would, yeah, no, it would theoretically end the broadcast because it wouldn't see me sending it. Now I'm thinking about it. Yeah, now I'm thinking reboot. Um, apparently everybody wants me to reboot. <laughs> All 
All right, I'll reboot it. You will throw some bumps? Okay, I'm good with that. I have Nita hanging out in the background. She's my savior. So, all right, I'm going to reboot this. I will be back. Of course, I'm trying to close the, the thing with the way gum pen. So that's not going to work. All right, I'll be right back. In the middle of the night, or early Friday morning, depending upon where you are in the world, a group of experienced comics professionals get together to examine and instruct about the art form that they love. That's great comic artwork on Comics by Night, Fridays at 5 a.m. Eastern, here on the Indie Comics Network, IndieComicsNetwork.com. What was that? This is not a show <laughs> It's Monty Moore. I'm a 30-year comics veteran in comics, games, and movies. And you've been watching one of my absolute favorite podcasts, Catch the Craze. You are watching Catch the Craze. What am I listening to? And you're listening to Catch the Craze. Where are all the indies at? A Catch the Craze podcast. What are you watching? I'm watching Catch the Craze. What are you going to do? Subscribe now to Catch the Craze, the number one show online for independent. Have you subscribed to? You are an independent. Catch the craze. Making moves on your own. Catch the craze. On your grind in the streets. Catch the craze. Join the movement. Catch the craze. Have a question. Have a question or comment for us to address on the show? Have a topic you want us to talk about? Email us at Indie Comics Network at gmail.com Want your comics to arrive in pristine condition? Head over to GeminiComicsSupply.com and save 10% on your next Gemini mailer order or anything in the Gemini Comics Supply store. Use coupon code RAGIN10 That's R-A-G-I-N 10 And I'm back. Hopefully things will be working. Seems to be so. Oh, oh, good. Oh, it is. Yep, just need to be rebooted because, you know, all computers suck. <laughs> Give me a second. I'll get everything up. Was aggravating. Okay, let's go back to trying to do this. And something else I've been trying to do with this is, uh, even though I'm using this old style for comics and all that, I want the lettering to be clear so I don't put any of the lettering behind the um, uh, all the textures and stuff I put on the page. And even still, I might change some of this before I go to print and everything. I just want to get kind of a look that I like the base of, and then I'll kind of go from there. I 
mean, I have built a lot of different color palettes, so... A lot of it will come down to how I like it with the texturing that I've added. So. What's weird about that whole thing though is I was able to hit the save icon button, but it wasn't doing anything else, so it did register something. Open my god again. <laughs> That's not it. That's it. Hoping everybody had a good Christmas or Hanukkah or wherever it was you were celebrating. And does anybody have anything fun planned for the weekend? I know what my crazy plans are that might involve sleeping. If you can hear my neighbors, but they're dancing around outside or something. I should film them and put them on YouTube. Just 
Take my butt up a bit. So it's getting kind of a brownish yellow, which is what I want. I might, um, my thought process right now is to make the others kind of more of, well, the background buildings are just going to be basically one color just to make my life easier. And I want to pop the, the front building. Got to stream and watch the fireworks. The kids, same old. Same holds with pizzazz. <clears throat> yeah, family get together, then getting drunk so time passes fast. I like it feels like 3D. All right, cool. It does have a kind of 3D feel. The The cool thing is, is when it's like printed and stuff, and again, when it's far away on the page, it, it blends in. And it looks more um it does form the colors really nicely but yeah this is how they used to print everything was done with dots and they would fill everything in i mean what they also used to use when they were actually coloring the books at least with marvel and dc they used um these actually, which is um, Dr. Martin's um, inks, basically, and I have a full set of his inks. This is just the uh, base colors with his two sets. Um, and I have both sets, and sometimes I like to paint in the classic way of doing things. Um, is it something else I want to play with on the stream at some point is I just got a bunch of Posca pens and I really want to play with them. So that will be something for the future. I was on, uh, well, I was watching um, Danny Warren Johnson's stream last week on, he streamed on Christmas Eve. I want to say it was Christmas Eve. Uh, it might have been the day before Christmas. It might have been the same day I was streaming. Yeah, I think it was the day before Christmas Eve. And um, I was watching his stream and he pulled out some Posca pens and I made the comment saying that I need to get more of those to play with. And he goes, yes, yes, you do. The funny thing was, I just ordered more of them, so. So I will bug him maybe later tonight, saying, well, I got my Posca pens. So I'm looking forward to breaking those out and playing with them. I haven't played with them yet. So you can come to me and get weird art techniques. And one of the other things about it, it's like there is a certain element where you don't worry completely about filling in the lines perfectly because the classic comics often would off print things and it would, um, look weird so so use lanky markers and colored pencils well nothing wrong with that um the typical markers i use um i was using copics for a while but i got into oh, uh, i got a huge set of them for like nothing um and they're really good like really good like stupid good and they're cheap um, you know, the colored pencils, I kind of went all out. I use Faber Castell, um, for mine, the polychromos. Absolutely love them. I pretty much spend all my money on art supplies. 
Okay. A little more I can do. That's a decent start to that. Oh, there's a. I'll show this off. This is a fully done page with lots of action and things for it. it kind of gives the look that I'm going for. Um, who who are expensive there? Oh, that sucks. Um, but yeah. So, it's a bit further in the book, and not, not a lot that I've, not a part I typically want to show too much about, so. Uh, I'll also, I will use some things, like I'll use some watercolor techniques and stuff to fill in some of the background stuff in there. Uh, like, this is all watercolor texture. Try to give the, just the feeling that they're in a forest without me having to constantly put in trees. <clears throat> hey, Crimson All, how are you? Hope you're doing well. Let's see. It's about that time. list so is about an hour into the stream even with technical difficulties so we're gonna go with my pull list of what are you reading these days and the book that I just read it's Ronin 2 book 2 I am a big Frank Miller fan even when he does some utter crap. Um, I generally like his stuff a lot. And I have to say, Ronin 2 is, in some ways, so far from what I've read, it's it's almost more of a lone wolf and cub um, homage than his original Ronin was. I mean, it's down to great scenes like this with it, where, he, where it's like the baby and all that. And this has a mother kind of experience with it and uh it has some amazing artwork by philip tan and the i believe all the breakdowns and everything were done by miller because there's definitely some millerisms in it but a great splash page here um is it? a medical leave more good let's see more of a good leave than a bad one well that's good i'm on permanent medical leave so yeah i get it it's fine um but it's got like i love hallmark pages like this in this stuff just the art's fun um i'm generally enjoying the story so far it's um so it's very frank miller and it's very if you're a fan of lone wolf and cub you'll enjoy it um it even has a callback to the original Ronin right in there. But yeah, so I'm looking forward to um, the next issue, which is on sale in mid-January. I think that's what's said actually in here, January 18th. So I'm looking forward to that. And it's a black and white book, which makes me think I should just go back and just do black and white. That's what I want. I think black and white gets a bad rap. Actually, I kind of want to add a little blood to this.
place is supposed to be kind of the uh, the dredges of the city in a lot of ways. The city isn't exactly the greatest place to be to begin with. Um, when I was saying it was on the Silken Road, it used to be a major waypoint on it. Um, but that was because of the um, travel through a certain area was very dangerous. Well, that area is no longer as dangerous, so the longer trip it was to come to Raven's Edge is now no longer necessary, so it's kind of fallen to the wayside. Um, and has a lot of people in it that are just trying not to be noticed. And where I have where all roads seem to lead to the cracked flagon, um, it's, again, this is, it goes back to some, one of my influences, a literary influence of mine from the early to mid 1980s to about the 1990s. And there was a revival in the early 2000s for a series, an anthology series called Thieves World. And it was basically this city of sanctuary, which had been once, you know, a great city, and it basically had fallen to the wayside. And I liked that idea. And there was an area in it called the Maze, where um, there was like where all the downtrodden would truly go, the true dregs of the dregs would hang, would um, live. It was this dangerous area of the city, and it was called the Maze because of all the everything was broken down um, and like the streets would change almost on a daily basis due to debris and other things that were there, debris, refuse. And you, know, you might be going through a building now to cut through an area. So it was a giant maze, but everything led to the vulgar unicorn. And that's kind of what my inspiration was, was that aspect of it. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm trying to make them look awesome. Hmm. Uh, actually, I think I might do a little inking uh, to kind of change things up a little bit. And that would be a bit more entertaining in some ways, I think. Let's see. Bear with me one second. Just wanna... Switch out for that for a sec while I just do a couple of things here. Messing with some files in the background. In my secret sauce of stuff, but hey. Okay, um, now what I did was, is I dropped all my templates on here, but I didn't want to completely bore you with where I pulled it from and things. Um, Let's do... 
Now this page is my scan page. Hmm. I basically put into here to work on. things I like about working digitally with inks, it's like an erase. If anyone's wondering, this is actually Jimmy Reyes's brush set, which I'm a big fan of. Um, when an inker actually makes a brush set for inking. It's got to be pretty good. Uh, the white yellow. Yeah, that's the texture of the page and then I hit it with a white and it turns everything, it turns the yellow over it so it looks like a classic kind of page. That's basically what I'm doing. And what would you say influenced my layouts and gridding? Uh, it's a combination of things. Uh, one of the big places I get I got a bunch of my inspiration from was um, manga. I mean, this is a very manga-based layout. Um, it's uh, worked for me in that sense. One of the other places I get a lot of my layout designs from is, um, well, what I should say inspired me. Uh, Todd McFarlane is a big influence on me. Uh, so I use some of his storytelling techniques, uh, along with Greg Capullo, uh, is another big one, uh, Sean Murphy. Lately, I've been a big fan of Daniel Warren Johnson. He is, uh, his stuff blows my mind. I love it. It has this feel to it that just, I love And it has this grittiness to it. But I would say that those would definitely be some of my bigger influences. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. Uh, Mark Silvestri? I mean, one of the ways I was teaching myself how to draw years ago was I literally copied his pages from Cyberforce. There is definitely some Frank Miller and some my grid layouts too. Actually, I use a storytelling technique that he uses a lot, which is the um, you have like a stack of panels on one side, then like to the left or right of it, you just have a big um a big big box that goes down the entire side. It's a very big Millerism that I utilize. <clears throat> Sean Murphy does it too. Yeah, DWJ blows it out of the water. Yeah, his energy is just yeah, he, he his stuff he makes me want to draw better. Like seeing his stuff just makes me want to draw better. really want to interview him. Hopefully he will respond to my, my request. Uh, 
uh yeah yeah i do i would definitely say i do that um but yeah i definitely use my my panel stacking definitely i as i was saying earlier i read a lot of manga so um that would make perfect sense of why when you see my stacking like that um this, this the page layout i'm using right here i'll make no bones about it, it it's it's a fairly standard manga style setup to a page layout which I've been told is one of the reasons why Marvel doesn't return my phone calls. Okay, let's see. Doesn't put pressure on onto you for working in that format. Um, I have been told straight up that one of the reasons why I haven't been uh, picked up by certain places more is that I have a manga style. Um, I've actively started to try to change my style a bit because... I have a dream that I want. Um, I have wanted a. I have wanted an image book ever since they basically came out. Um, and they generally don't really look at you unless you've worked for Marvel or DC. And I have been straight up told that one of the reasons why they won't really look at my work is because I have a very strong manga impulse. So it does do things, and I said I've been trying to change certain things lately. Probably a ways off on it, but hey. Um, Nobuhiro Watsuki was probably one of my favorite creators for a very long time. I have mixed feelings on him now. I can still respect his artwork. Kenjin was a huge influence on me. Um, both story-wise and art-wise. So... It's probably one of the biggest ones. Uh, Rumiko Takahashi is another big one. Um, a huge fan of Ranma One Half. Um, I know a lot of people like to point to Inuyasha and things, and um, forget the name of her current book. I heard it's good though. Now my conflict. Uh, different mangaka. I really like the work of Change the Perception. But I don't struggle with the separation of art and the artist as much. Yeah, I can, I can respect that. I have a hard time with it just due to experiences of my childhood um, and what he's accused of doing. It's actually what he's guilty of doing. I mean, he he. Yeah, he did admit to it, so. And I can't quite say what he did, but let's just use the, we'll call it cheese pizza. He liked a lot of cheese pizza. And from my understanding, his wife did too. But, I mean, the story of Kenshin is a story of redemption. So, 
Can a person be redeemed? Takahashi, the creator of Sailor Moon, or the other who made Captain Tsubasa. Rumiko Takahashi is the one I was referring to. She made Ranma one half. Um, wasn't it like Medico or something who did Sailor Moon? I can't remember her name. Um, I like Sailor Moon. I wasn't as into it as some of my friends were, but I like Sailor Moon. Um, one of the other big ones, and I can't think of the creator's name right now, was Battle Angel. I loved that manga. Well, I loved the original anime. It was just like an OVA, and it was just amazing. And my glasses slipped in. Yeah, now you go. Okay. Yeah. When I eventually do my Kickstarter for this book, I almost like the auction off all of the art as well. I might keep a little bit of it for myself, but for the most part, I think I'll option it. Yes, Takahashi also um, created Inuyasha. Huh, the comments are delayed? Oh, that's a little weird. Maybe it's because of the reboot. Interesting thing you can do with Clip Studio that I highly am a proponent of is you can turn your um, pen tip directly into an eraser just by clicking on the, um, the checker box down here. And you could literally just erase with the pen tip if you needed to. Uh, super handy little feature. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, I read I read uh, Inuyasha. I enjoyed it. Um, I'm more of a fan of Ranma. Um, I think Inuyasha is very good. It's Rama just appealed to me more. I much was more into the well, the romantic comedy of the martial arts school and stuff. It just appealed to me. Actually, the one of the things I'm doing with um with this page and hole and hole is. Uh, where I have the whole thing of Danny. It's a very manga trope to make sure that when you first introduce your character, you get a full shot of her. A full shot of the character. Which tablet I'm working on? I'm working on a Wacom Tablet 24. Um, I actually won it. I had a Wacom 16. And I had an old... Um, the old version of that too. Uh, actually, I think it was a Wacom 21 I had. Um, and my, I got as a gift at one point a Mobile Studio Pro, which I used to take everywhere for me, but then COVID happened and I never went anywhere. So <laughs> more or less collects dust. Yeah, it was a great Shona entry or that series 
back to back with ElfQuest. Yeah, yeah, ElfQuest is great. Um, Pinnies did a wonderful job. Um, actually, for a while, had Fantasy Quarterly number 15, I believe it was, which is the first ElfQuest. Uh, I had a friend who was more of a fan of ElfQuest than I was. I ended up actually giving it to him. Just gave it to him. Didn't sell it or anything. I'm just like, here you go. I wonder what that thing's worth now. Did a film over the 16 screen smudge out. I worry I'm wearing it out. Oh, you put a film over it? Um, I've seen people do that. It wears out tips quicker. I mean, my first Wacom tablet um, was pre USB. So. And I had such a hard time drawing with that thing, trying to separate looking at the screen while drawing. I never could quite get it. I always had to see the screen. Let's see, gut see which uh, switches from color to transparent on an express key on my Wacom tablet. The handy to switch from draw to erase. Yep, that's very true. The C16 doesn't have a glass. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, all right. Um, Does it feel more like drawing on paper? That's actually one of the reasons I kind of stopped working all digitally is I just didn't like the didn't really like the feel and I wasn't really liking my line art. Like um, some of this is was originally all created digitally. Um, for one of my false starts, I actually reused the artwork. Um, I was just like, I'm not redrawing this. So I'm gonna reincorporate it. So. And something I talk about also in my intro where I, where I have my Sentinels watch on the first page. I kind of take back the screen and talk about things. Hey, putting pressure on it, scratch down sometimes really peeves me. Yeah, I could respect that. That's that's annoying. One of the things I'm going to be doing with this is I have his face there, and then I have the establishing shot here. I'm actually going to reverse these two panels. Um, I thought about it after the fact when I drew it. I'm like, you know, these really should be flipped the other way. So I'm going to be... That's one of the other bonuses of doing digital is that um, I can do that easy. Let's see, I already have a few people to do a couple of alternate covers for me as well. Um, one of them will be my friend Ian. Try to get Dave to do one, but he's under contract, so he can't do one for me right now. But I tried. I did try to get Dave Finch. Maybe I can get him to do something.
aus. Oh, another great place where I can cheat a little bit and not have to worry. I can just fill things in. real quick on things. I have it silenced, so I am waiting for a message, so I just want to make sure nothing came in. Still got plenty of time before I think I'd have to really worry about it, but well, that was loud. Somebody crashed into something. Realized I didn't draw a limb sage on, on her cheek. Should probably put that in. Danny has a mark on her cheek that is significant to the story. actually denotes her as uh, she was a slave and well she didn't like being a slave so she left needless to say that's caused some problems for her the 
mark is um pen prompts can run it in. And screw it, multi-liner. Smaller. But yeah, she was, um, her and her family that she was with were all, on the earlier parts of it, were gladiatorial slaves, and they decided that they didn't like being that, so they left. And that caused some issues for them. And that's one of the reasons why she's hiding at Raven's Edge. And it will deal with the storyline as a whole of what's going on. She was the one of the Falcons. The one of Kelikos, one of the Kelikos Falcons of Iron Spire. She was collectively known as the Merlin because of her abilities. the character that I had Kare was called. Do you have a story about aliens? Yeah, I don't see why I wouldn't. Um, I mean, I won't say aliens won't show up in this story. It's a fantasy story, but Igorice Burroughs is a influence on me, and I do have a solar system that I have ideas for. For instance, um, I have a Martian-like planet that I call Skalud, and that has um, what you call aliens on it. Um, the events of this world take place in something called the Shattered Coast, and one of the things that made it such is it was literally hit by meteors. Might have been a comment. I uh, have to check my notes on what it was that made that made the shatters get shattered coast. Um, the mark on Danny's face is a alchemical brand, basically. Um, it's effectively nanotechnology. So I do work a lot of science fiction into my fantasy. Um, I get a lot of that from the books of the New Sun, which is, if you're ever curious about like Warhammer 40k and things like that, they get a lot of stuff from, from those stories. It's one of the places that they had influence from, it's from um, Gene Colon, not Gene Colon, sorry, um, can't think of his name. Um, No, not Glenn Cook. Gene Wolfe. Um, and they, it basically has a, uh, that kind of an aspect to it. Um, 
And I'll also say there was a cartoon when I was growing up that I was heavily kind of inspired by. It was called Thunder of the Barbarian. So you get a lot of my stuff from that. So I say it's sword and sorcery. It's a um, uh, wuxia sword and sorcery, but it's definitely got some science fantasy elements and things. Um, I do have an idea for a science fiction comic I want to do at some point that would be a very hard science fiction comic. Um, I don't think it would have aliens in it though because I want to I want it to move more on the actual science of um, a faster than light travel and I think it's the Fermi paradox is what I want to explore. Which is the this for me paradox. Let me just double check real quick. Yep, for me paradox, and that deals with. Um, why we have seen no signs of extraterrestrial life. So I guess in some ways it will deal with aliens, but it also kind of won't, because um, the whole point of the Fermi Paradox is that we haven't found extraterrestrial life. Um, and just dealing with the fact that faster than light travel is... If we could actually do it, which isn't a big if, it's a, more of a when we could do it. Because NASA is act actively working on the warp drive right now. So um, would that allow us to um, break through the barriers of dealing with the all the dust that's in space that would basically prevent us from traveling at the speed of light. Because if you hit dust at the speed of light with your spaceship, you might as well hit a brick wall. <clears throat> you got a plot about aliens, um, but scenes from perspective never seen before. Be interested in seeing that. Um, I'd be careful before I build anything as never seen before. So, so there's, there's a lot of science fiction writers out there. Uh, do I think the Boots Void would could be a sector where alien race expanded and built Dyson spheres there? Um, I, I wouldn't say it isn't possible, but part of the I mean, the Boots Void is interesting because it's this giant blackness of space. Um, and looking at the technology we currently have, if we, if we actually dwelt in the Boots Void, we wouldn't have known there was anything out of the Boots Void until like the 1960s. So that aspects of it kind of interests me. Um, given the technology of it. Um, that we have to date. Um, what about bend the space to get far away from the place you're trapped? That's what we call warp. Uh, that's effectively what the warp drive does, is bend space. You bend the space in front of you, and then you extend it behind you. But the problem is, is you, you travel effectively on a bubble of the space. So um, you effectively have a bubble of our universe around you because when you bend space, you're moving outside. You're kind of moving outside of our universe, and everything builds up on the bubble. Bubble still. So when you suddenly turn off that bubble, all of that stuff that's accumulated has to go someplace. And one of the thoughts of it is it's suddenly going to go in lots of different directions at the speed of light. So that would be problematic for if you suddenly visited another life form and then flung a dust cloud at a planet at the speed of light. Uh, I jumped out of the sofa when I heard that they discovered a possible solution to the nuclear energy waste issue. Well, they're working on nuclear fission right now, so um, 
that's pretty cool. Plus, it involves shooting lasers at stuff, and I'm all for that. Uh, and then capitalizing on the implosion of the um, the energy that they create. So that's kind of cool. Let's see nuclear punk? Yeah, I guess it's possible we could see nuclear punk in our lifetime. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they have a test test version of the of the warp drive in our lifetime. I honestly would not be surprised. Um, do it. I I honestly don't know how far away it is. I would say it's easily another twenty years, but. I think it's possible we will see we will see something like that in our lifetime. But building a Dyson sphere would be very interesting. Um, it would explain where you would not suddenly have starlight in an area. But yeah. Give me one second, everybody. Do you believe in the Roswell case? Or is, it's an urban legend. Um, I do not believe we have been visited by alien life. Um, again, the Fermi paradox kind of precludes it along with the whole aspect of um, if something was looking at us right now from one of the closest star systems to us that has potentially habitable life, they would see the age of the dinosaurs. So if they wanted to check it out and be like, hey, dinosaurs are cool, but if they had faster than light travel, they would know that there aren't dinosaurs there right now, and then it's trying to figure out, well, do we want to know what's there? Um, but it... It's hard pressed to get me to think that we've been visited by other life. Before anybody brings up any of the recently um, declassified images that the government has shown and stuff like that, I don't think any of those are spaceships. Actually, a lot of them I can make a solid argument for that they're literally something on the radar. And what I mean by something on the radar, I mean something on the camera. So. <laughs> Like a glitch or something. Um, the special effects guys out there who basically trashed all of them. <laughs> Along with most major physicists. I don't think we're alone in the universe. I think that there is, given just the nature of life on this planet and the fact that there are literally billions of other habitable worlds out there then if probably more than that i i think it'd be um it would be stupid for me to say that there's no life or i don't believe in life i think that the possibility of life is very very high on other planets does it look anything like us probably not I mean, I guess they could have carbon life forms that evolve like us. I think the circumstances would be very interesting if that were the case. Um, but I don't think that would be the case. I mean, bipedal life, the way we have it, is we're not exactly the best designed creatures in that sense. Based on the picnic on the side of the road here uh, and surreal trash they left, maybe they are now. <laughs> yeah, that that's yeah. That's...
I, I don't, I just don't think we've been visited by the life. I mean, do I believe in UFOs? Yeah, you look up in the sky, you see crap, you don't know what it is all, all the time. That's the UFO. I would also love to do a um, uh, a comic at some point dealing with a black hole uh, and a space station studying the black hole. And I think that could be very interesting. I mean, a lot of yeah, I'm not saying I don't believe in aliens. I just don't think they visited us. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, as I said, there's literally billions of other habitable worlds out there, if not more. Um, so yeah, I think alien life exists. I just don't think they visited us. And I kind of agree with Stephen Hawking. I don't think we'd want to meet them. Hope they. If we do get visited, we hope they. They're not. Uh, not humans would bum you out. Yeah, I can respect that. That would um, bum me out too. I mean, this is this is a solid argument that octopuses aren't native to this planet. So uh, maybe we are. We have been visited. I don't think I. I don't know if I believe that. I believe the cephalopod. I think there isn't a um, an evolutionary chain for cephalopods. But I, I just know that there was an argument for it. So. Bring us tanker memes. Oh god, that's all we need is more memes. I got a cat nearby. <laughs> no, no, god, no. Uh. But yeah, I mean, aliens are interesting. I just don't think that like they are in Star Trek. For something to evolve like that, I mean, you would have to have the same circumstances that we do. Um, not saying it's not possible. I just would expect it to be different evolutionary standards. Also, it would involve that the very similar ecosystem in a lot of ways. It just starts to become a bit too far-fetched. Um, but hey, I mean, it is possible. It happened here, so it could happen anywhere. Yeah, I'm sure hops. What the, huh? You hungry? Yeah, it's coming towards the end of the stream. I'll feed you in a minute. My orange creep here. And that's the face of Alley Cat Comics. He's my old man. John, he's like 12, 13. You know, cat. Yep. How are you trying to sneak in? All right, come here. Come on, sweetie. There you are. He hates being picked up. Loves to sit in my lap on his terms. Hence why I just left. I knocked shit over. God, you just want attention. Mm. Yes, I love you. Come on. No. It's 
not one of my streams unless our cat shows up in it. Uh, Charles okay. affection when begging hates everything out the lost. Yeah, that's that's a cat. Yeah. That's a cat. Okay. Let's see. It has been about two hours, and I think with the technical difficulties we had, I did have a nice science talk, so that's always good, staple of my stream. Uh, I'm going to be calling it here for the evening, and I will see you all next week, and I wish you all to have a wonderful, happy new year. Don't do anything I would do. What am I saying? Do everything that I would do. It'd be great. Uh, it's great fun, even though I'm going to be incredibly boring. Um... But have a wonderful have a wonderful new year and you know hug and kiss your loved ones for me. Uh, but you all have a great night and I will see you all next year. Bye. Have a question or comment for us to address on the show? Have a topic you want us to talk about? Email us at indiecomicsnetwork at gmail.com. Want your comics to arrive in pristine condition? Head over to GeminiComicsSupply.com and save 10% on your next Gemini mailer order or anything in the Gemini Comics Supply store. Use coupon code RAGIN10. That's R-A-G-I-N 10. Mm -hmm.